Hello and welcome to Press TV News Analysis. I'm Kavit Akhbayi. Well, the, the clock keeps ticking on the U.S.'s debt crisis. The latest, President Barack Obama would veto a Republican plan on raising the debt ceiling. Some are dismissing this as theater. In this edition of Press TV News Analysis, we will look at this crisis, including where the bailout money has gone and the Fed's function in order to get a clue as to why America, Americans, their economy, and their quality of life is on life support. There's less than a week left until the U.S. hits an August 2nd deadline to raise the federal government's $14.3 trillion debt ceiling. Still, Democrats and Republicans are sticking to rival plans for a way out of the impasse. It's really a grand political theater here in Washington, D.C., with both parties speaking to their interest groups without speaking to the interests of the nation, the economy, and indeed the world economy. The Republicans have proposed a two-step plan with debt limit increases. They say the plan is based on the so-called cut, cap, and balance bill, earlier rejected by the Democratic-led Senate. The White House says the Obama administration is opposed to the Republicans' new plan. It doesn't solve the problem. There's no point in putting the economy at risk by kicking the can further down the road. The U.S. will default on its debt for the first time in history and if agreement is not reached in time. The U.S. current national debt is the highest in the world. The Treasury is borrowing over $4.2 billion a day, adding to the current debt. China, Japan, the U.K., oil exporting countries and Brazil are some of the major holders of the U.S. Treasury bonds. The department has forecast that the debt may rise to around $20 trillion by 2015. The debt has increased about $8 trillion in just nine years. So who may be blamed for this calamitous scenario? The rising budget deficit is primarily due to the government's expenditure compared to its total revenues. Figures show that the federal government is putting wholesale burden on common Americans in the form of individual income tax. Corporate houses, which own about 90 percent of the country's wealth, pay just 9 percent of taxes. The new Republican plan does not set out any revenue increases, something Obama has insisted on. The president wants America's wealthiest citizens and biggest corporations to contribute more to government coffers. Lawmakers remain deeply divided, despite several rounds of meetings between the White House and congressional leaders. The impasse over the debt ceiling is already being felt in the U.S., with shares continuing to drop on Wall Street. The greenback also dipped against major currencies, leading to a boost in oil prices. As a default is looming, many say that U.S. politicians will come to a last-minute agreement. But the question remains, will all be well with the American economy if that happens? This, especially as Washington continues its costly military wars abroad, plunging Americans more and more in debt. Well, let's see if we can get some answers to those questions. We have uh, Jeff Steinberg joining us from Washington. He's from uh, the Executive Intelligence Review magazine. He's a senior editor there. From New York, we have Michael Burns, an economic analyst, joining us. And rounding off the list, we have Chief Investment Strategist from AVA Investment uh, Analytics, uh, Mike uh, Stathis, who joins us on the phone from Texas. And I'd like to start with you, Mac Stata. The recent ABC News Washington Post poll is showing that the U.S. government is rapidly losing the face of the American people. The majority of Americans are just dissatisfied with both Democrats and Republicans. How do you see the way that both Democrats and Republicans are handling this debt crisis? Well, it's just uh, theatrics is all it is. Uh, <laughs> it's just they, they're, they're vying for political power. And the reality, the unfortunate reality is, is that it doesn't really matter what party gets the, the power because both parties are essentially the same. And uh, they don't care about the working class Americans. All they care about are the corporations, the banks. Um, and, and so this is kind of a downward spiral that we, we, we will continue to uh, be in for indefinitely, most likely. Well, let's get uh, the views of uh, economic analyst uh, Michael Burns from New York. Uh, tell us, Michael Burns, if you can. Of course, this uh, sh uh, program is only 25 minutes long, but uh, shortly, but briefly, how did the U.S., the world's largest economy, come to the brink of a catastrophic default on its debt? What has gone wrong? 
Well, one thing uh, to start with, the, the law requires that debt to be raised uh, um, on a sequential basis. But moreover, and most important, uh, this is the third time that the American people feel that they are being lied to with very severe consequences. The first time was in 2003 with the weapons of mass destru destruction that Iraq was supposed to possess, an outright misstatement, a lie in the minds of many. Second time was in 2008 when there was this great uproar over the world economy collapsing and uh, resulting in the taxpayer having to finance these big uh, uh, inflated salaries and bonuses of Wall Street. Uh, that was a, a, a stake in the heart of the confidence of the American people. And now we have to face this nonsense of chicken little, the sky is going to fall. Well, it's not going to fall. And uh, that's how the American people view it, many of them. And uh, with this uh, din and noise from Washington, uh, this hysteria, if you will, there's many, many of, of the citizens who just are annoyed as the dickens about it and uh, are not responding. Uh, Jeff Steinberg, let's look at what uh, the uh, uh, lawmakers are debating, basically spending cuts and expense. And, of course, uh, at the top of the list is the highest expense. That's the U.S. Uh, military. you got over 600-plus bases maintaining that. Spending close to well, a trillion dollars of it, billions are for the war. So question comes, why not decrease the war spending? Well, of course, that's a very, very good point. Look, the, the, the Bush administration... Uh, took us to war in Iraq, uh, and as one of the other guests from New York said, it was based on a complete lie. Uh, and for the first time in the history of the United States, we went to war and simultaneously gave a significant tax cut to the wealthiest 10% or more of the population. Uh, you can't do that without creating national bankruptcy. We also deregulated the financial system and imposed a completely illegal and unconstitutional taxpayer's guarantee on Wall Street's biggest gambling binge in history, which is what blew up in 2007, 2008, and still continues to plague us. The good news, I would add, is that in addition to a uh, serious push for a withdrawal of American forces from both Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and a drawdown of our bloated military budget, there is also legislation, bipartisan legislation, in the House of Representatives to reinstate Glass-Steagall, which was the 1933 law that broke up the too big to fail banks of the Depression era and reestablished the wall of separation between commercial banking, depository banking and lending, from the speculation of the brokerages and insurance companies, and now, of course, add to that the hedge funds and all of these uh, ridiculously leveraged debts. Uh, give that debt back to those Wall Street gamblers, and you're already a significant step towards beginning to bring this problem under control, where you can start to reinvest in job creation, infrastructure improvement, and reconstituting a physical economy that generates wealth rather than just debt. There's 33 co-sponsors on H.R. 1489, and I expect that very shortly we're going to see a majority of members of the House supporting this bill and an identical bill coming into the U.S. Senate probably within days. So there are solutions that are historically in line with the American Constitution and with those occasions where we've used sensible economic policies rather than being victims of greedy speculators. And then you have uh, uh, things that are being thrown into uh, the Senate, of which they say the United States to go at war at any time, something that uh, U.S. President Barack Obama wants for it to get approved. You have, uh, what, the full specter dominance uh, doctrine in terms of military equipment, uh, in which the United States wants to, wants to be superior in land, air, and sea, where they have, what, intercontinental ballistic missile submarines, billions of dollars each that they cost, uh, and several hundred million dollars to maintain. What about these types of notions and expenses? Well, there's a, there's a pushback against that. Um, in fact, there's an article in the current issue of Time magazine by, of all people, Richard Haas, 
who's actually the uh, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And while he's not calling for a new isolationism, he's calling for a recalibrating of U.S. policy where money is invested domestically on job creation and on restoring our infrastructure and those kinds of things at the expense of this enormous expenditure on maintaining the U.S. position as the world's leading military power and also, of course, as the world's leading military spender. So I think that there's a dramatic mood shift that even a handful of people in the establishment are getting a whiff of. But the mood in the American population is that anybody who is not prepared to take radical measures to restore this balance and put the general welfare of the American people ahead of the interests of a bunch of Wall Street swindlers, their political careers are going to be very short. And all of this uh, really goes back to one main uh, thing, and that's money, if there's money uh, to uh, spend overall of the U.S. government. Well, let's, let's look at the trail of money here. Uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, go to you, uh, Mike Astathis. First of all, your reaction about the U.S. Treasury or the U.S. government borrowing a little over $4 billion per day. That's $125 billion a month, translating $1.5 trillion a year just in loans to A, finance day-to-day -day operations in the United States, which then results in, well, B, addition to the current over $14 trillion in debt. Well, it's, uh, I guess it would be justifiable if you saw some, uh, some results. But uh, the sad reality is that they keep spending and spending, and there's absolutely no results whatsoever. Uh, you know, one, one thing I, wanna, I would like to back up, if I could, and address, uh, I guess it's Mr. Steinberg's uh, comments. Uh, while I agree, I think we're essentially looking at, 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 at a hot air situation. I agree with the job creation, but until we address the unfair trade policies, there will not be job creation in this country. We have rules of unfair trade that our trading partners uh, um, have, and uh, this is causing jobs to go overseas. We have uh, uh, EPA, OSHA, uh, very costly barriers, which uh, India, China do not abide by. Um, other nations have universal health care system. Uh, so obviously you can transport facilities and jobs overseas, and the employers don't have to share those costs. Until we uh, create an environment with our trading partners whereby the rules of trade uh, are more equitable, we're not going to see real job creation uh, in this country. And ironically, in my opinion, it's the corporate leaders who use this excuse of high regulatory barriers. They're the ones who have shuttled money to lobbyists to get these uh, regulations passed so they can have an excuse. It's a complete farce. I'd like to take a look, so, at, the, I'd like to take a look at the Federal Reserve, if I may. Uh, uh, and I'd like to bring in Michael Burns here. Michael Burns, tell us about the Federal Reserve. Uh, let's look at what they have done. Since the 2008 financial crisis, uh, well, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve has given over, the estimates vary, based, may perhaps you could shed some light, from $8 trillion to $16 trillion. These were to the large banks and other financial corporations. In essence, it was supposed to be a U.S. taxpayer bailout. We're talking about job creation. Why hasn't this created the jobs? And in turn, obviously, for the U.S. economy to pick up. Well, it hasn't created jobs because um, uh, what, what the Federal Reserve did was just run the printing press. They created money. They pushed it into the banks. The banks um, uh, take this money at practically zero interest rates and put it into government bonds at 4%, almost, a, 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 almost printing money themselves. What they don't do is lend it out. And the reason they don't lend it out is that the corporations are very nervous about creating jobs, and that's for two reasons. Number one, during these, this recession, they were able to use computer technology to... Uh, uh, eliminate and, um, and, and make far more efficient their management structure. So they don't need the new jobs. And second of all, they're concerned about the potential uh, 
mischief by the Obama administration in terms of raising taxes. But the uh, money from the federal, know, I mean, tell us about the Federal Reserve. Insecure. That money that it went to help the banks, the private uh, institutions such as bank uh, or any of these uh, money institutions, basically they have rebounded and they were supposed to, supposed to have helped the U.S. economy in terms of, for example, creating jobs. So uh, we're talking about the Fed Reserve, which is, it. by the way, not part of the U.S. government. Many people don't even uh, know that. Well, what, uh, what's your question? Yeah, My me, question I, is the I function answer? of the Federal Reserve, where you see all that money, trillions of dollars from the financial so, crisis, going to these financial institutions, including the banks, but not to have trickled down in terms of what they should have done, instead of just loading up their pockets, the bankers, the bonuses, and of course, then you have the American people. We're looking at what? Uh, one in five American people living on food stamp. Well, the Federal Reserve has a limited function. The, the job of the Federal Reserve is to, is to make a market in the government securities, and they've done that. They also have the ability to expand the money supply. They've done that. They also have the ability to control short-term interest rates. They've done that, bringing them down to practically zero. As a result, the banks ha are now sitting on all this cash, and the corporations mm -hmm. are also sitting on a lot of cash. Well, let's, let's see what sitting on this cash has done. jobs because the demand isn't there. Let's see what this uh, sitting on this cash has done. We'd like to take a, a look at the U.S. wealth distribution chart, if we can, uh, for a moment before I come to you, Jeff Steinberg, and see uh, uh, the result of sitting on cash uh, on the American people, if we can run that. Okay, there you have the financial wealth distribution uh, as of the year 2007, and we can see uh, in terms of what has occurred overall uh, that an average American pays a higher income tax rate than corporations uh, in terms of uh, the distribution, at least there on the wealth. Uh, Jeff Steinberg, looking at the corporate taxes that are paid when you compare it to what the average American is paying, why is it that corporations are paying the lowest, which is 9%, I believe, as compared to uh, the average American, and also combine that with the distribution wealth of which uh, you have uh, the, the top, uh, you have about 36 to 40 percent of the wealth of the United States being controlled by the wealthy, which is only one percent of the population. Look, we've had a binge <clears throat> of uh, deregulation that goes back really to the late 70s early 1980s, and as the result, we've basically shut off our ability to uh, direct credit into the real economy. And uh, along the way, uh, we've also absolutely failed to prosecute some of the most egregious cases of white-collar criminality, uh, probably in the history of the world. There are three reports. You were referencing the Federal Reserve just a moment ago. Uh, last week, the uh, GAO came out with an audit of the Fed. It was something that was attached as an amendment to the Dodd-Frank bill by Senator Bernie Sanders. And it not only revealed that $16 trillion in emergency loans went out to Wall Street when, in fact, there was no justification for that. If we had gone back to a Glass-Steagall standard, there would have been no need for a taxpayer's bailout because we would have protected commercial banks that are vital to the real economy and let the gamblers suffer their gambling losses. We didn't do that. Instead, we said, as one of the other guests indicated, the sky is falling. We've got to act. We've got to basically bail out these criminals. You have in the, in the Sanders Commission GAO report evidence that officials of the New York Federal Reserve, who are private citizens, were given waivers to continue to hold stock options in companies that they were directly bailing out. This was criminal, and it should have been prosecuted as criminal. You had the Angelides report, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission study that came out in February, and then a bipartisan study that came out of the Senate, co-signed by Senator Carl Levin and Tom Coburn. Uh, all of this laid out a pattern of clear criminality where government regulators and federal prosecutors simply let people get away with white-collar crime. And as the result, 
American taxpayers have trillions of dollars in debt that is completely illegal. In the 1930s, the Senate had the Pecora Commission. Leading Wall Street bankers were frog marched off to Sing Sing prison because of tax evasion and crimes that were on a scale far below the crimes committed by the top Wall Street people today. But because they pour billions of dollars into lobbying and con contributions to political campaigns, they're getting away literally with murder, and we've reached a break point where the American people aren't going to tolerate it anymore, but we're also at the verge of a complete economic breakdown crisis unless this policy is reversed. Not to mention the billions that were lost in the, the wars based on fraud and the security contractors, but unfortunately we've ran out of time. Thank you so much. We're sure. just uh, hearing a senior editor of the Executive Intelligence Review magazine there, Jeff Steinberg from Washington. The uh, economic analyst Michael Burns gave us his statements from New York and also the chief, uh, uh, from the chief investment strategist of AVA Investments Analytics. We had Mike Stathis who gave his statements on the phone from Texas. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to send us your comments. Newsroom at PressTV.ir. From Mikava Tahwe and the entire team, it's goodbye.